Okay, um, welcome to the second half of lecture one. So I'm going to denote this as E at 4510 and 1-2. Right. So uh, all I'm going to do today is uh, sort of fill in some of the gaps from the last lecture and as well as some, uh, give some leading on things for the next one. So last time we proved that uh, that NFAs are equal to DFAs, right? They have the same uh, relative power. What I haven't said is what these languages are called, by the way. So they have a name, and it's a very important name. Uh, they're called regular languages. So, a uh, language uh, is uh, regular uh, if and only if there exists a DFA, we'll say a language L is regular, if and only exists, there exists a, a DFA D uh, such that the language of D is equal to L. So every regular language has a DFA. Every DFA describes a regular language. These are the same. Or NFA, you know. So these, these are exactly the same characterization here. So uh, now just to give you some cool facts about uh, regular languages, which you can use the definition for. So if I say in a homework problem or anything, if I say a language is regular, your next instinctive step should be there exists a DFA for it. And then you start doing things with the DFA. So let me give you first a definition. Uh, closure. This is more like a abstract algebra kind of thing, but I'm going to try and be generic. So if, uh, if let's just say bl a blank thing. Let's say if, a uh, triangle is an operation, like any operation, and A comma B are in some 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 set, and uh, A triangle B is also in the set. Uh, then we say uh, literally blank is closed under whatever triangle may be. So just let's give some quick examples. Uh, addition. So if A, B are positive natural numbers, or positive integers, then clearly A plus B is going to be positive. Right? Ah, but uh, division is not. So if a comma b in fact are even just integers, let's say they're any integers. Uh, then a uh, divided by b is not always uh, an integer, right? Take two and three or something, right? You have three, three, three halves. That's now uh, irrational. So these are what we mean by closure, right? We can also do this equally for unary operations, right? So like a unary operation like minus, right? But I mean in the unary sense. So like A is an, is an, is an integer implies that, uh, let me make sure that this is a good one and this is a bad one. And this is a good one, right? So A is an integer implies that minus A is an integer, right? It's quite natural, right? Matrices are closed under multiplication, kind of, right? They're always going to be a matrix. Maybe they won't be the same kind of matrix, but they'll be a matrix. Integers are going to be integers. Natural numbers will be natural numbers, but, you know, things like this. So, okay. Now let's let, let's show you some cool facts about uh, uh, regular languages. So. Uh, oh, not definition, excuse me. Theorem. Yes. 
uh, regular languages are closed under complement. So what does that mean? Uh, so proof, we want to show that uh, if L is regular, then this implies that L complement uh, is regular. Oh, and I'll say that by the way, it is an if and only if relation. Uh, but and the proof should apply then, right? Because you take a complement and a complement, you get back to the same thing. Uh, so the way I'm going to I'm going to prove it in uh, this way: let L be regular. Then let's let's just say there exists uh, D such that if I can remember the tuples in order, we get sigma uh, Q. Q0, uh, delta F, and then I say, uh, let's make D prime, which is equal to sigma Q, Q0, delta F complement. So what I've done is I've taken the final states and recall that uh, f complement is equal to q minus f. So I've taken every state that wasn't an accepting state and made it accepting. I've taken every state that wasn't a final state and I've made it uh, a final state now, right? So now I claim that, that uh, d prime decides uh, l complement or the language of D prime equals L. Uh, proof, if X, it's kind of obvious actually, but if X is in uh, L complement, then this is true if and only if that uh, D accepts, oh, excuse me, D rejects, which is true if and only if that uh, D prime accepts, right? And similarly, if X is not an L complement, uh, that's if and only if D prime accepts, if and only if uh, D prime rejects. Okay, the formality here didn't give us anything, but it's just good rigor, right? It's, it should be obvious. Right. Normally, you take the the, the 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 string on the DFA, the structure, the topology, everything about the DFA is this is the same except the answer. So, and the answer is arbitrary; it doesn't really mean anything. Right. So you go through the DFA, and then if you normally would have rejected, this time you accept. Right. You just flip the bit, the answer. Right. So. Uh, here's a here's a here's going to be an interesting one. Uh, theorem, um, regular uh, languages are closed under concatenation, concatenation. So this is a, this is a binary uh, operator. It takes two things. So so what does concatenation mean? Concatenation means like L1, L2. Sometimes this is written as L1, and there's a tiny dot like that, L2. I don't like that because it looks like composition of functions. But uh, these are strings. So what this is is equal to set x, y, which is always a string, such that x is an L1 and y is an L2. So it's any string from the first language, any string from the second language, you compose them. Excuse me, not compose, you concatenate them. That's in the in the concatenation of these languages, right? So the proof, I'm going to actually do it visually. So what I'm going to do 
is let's draw a DFA. L1 and L2 clearly have DFA, so let me first draw a generic DFA. Um, I think. Let's say it has uh, something like that. Okay. And uh, this is an accept state. Okay, and then this is a final, these are the final states. So, what does that mean? It means like, I've basically drawn a DFA here, uh, but I've tried to draw it in such a way that I make no assumptions about the structure, right? Um, Okay, something like that. Okay, so I, I I haven't drawn any lines between it. I have no idea what's going on. I can only say what every DFA has about these sort of DFAs. Every DFA has a start state, one start state. Every DFA has one or more final states, right? So here I've just said three, make it look simple. So uh, what I'm gonna do now is say, let's say uh, since, um, since L1, L2 are uh, regular, there exists uh, DFAs D1, comma D2. And let's say this is D1, and let's say, let me put it somewhere else. I'll put it right here, D1, D2. Who knows what their structure is internally? Doesn't matter. Then this, I claim, is a DFA for L1 uh, concatenated with L2. What I'm going to do is for every final state, I'm going to add an epsilon transition to the uh, new start state. And that's it. And I claim then, then uh, this uh, is a DFA. Let me write it the next time. DFA for L1 concatenated with L2. Um, if I wanted to write this formally, I would also have to remove the final state uh, acceptance. For these two right so i would say that i can go ahead and do that actually why not oops just to just to make sure everything is 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 on is perfect those are not all the same size but it's fine <laughs> so, yeah uh so what i would say is you know, remove final states from D1, uh, remove accept, remove start state from D2, and add epsilon transitions of this form, right? So the proof here is sort of visual and kind of obvious, which is, is what I like, you know, it's quite nice. All right, let's continue. Uh, I promise I'm proving this for a reason, not just as, you know, a sequence of fun facts. Uh, let's do two more. Uh, regular uh, languages are closed under clean start. Or the clean start. And this one is sort of maybe as easy. Oh, I'm barely in the room. All right. So uh, recall that the the clean star operation, uh, or maybe I have not defined it. Maybe I should do that. I can't remember. 
So uh, if L any any uh, language, then L star is equal to uh, the union of uh, L i for i equals zero to infinity. So what that means is this contains the uh, empty set, excuse me, the empty string. It uh, contains, uh, oh, hold on a second. Contains L concatenated with itself. It contains L concatenated with itself three times, and so on. Right. So to prove the uh, that this is closed under a clean star operation, we basically when we finish when the the string traverses the DFA, it reaches the end and then it's done. We want it to like do that again for the next time we're in L or some other time, any number of times, really. So what we do, and the first idea everyone has is they think, okay, uh, I'm going to just epsilon transition to the start state. And that's not totally wrong, but uh, there is a very small gotcha if you do it incorrectly. What you should do is create a new start state. Make it accepting. And then uh, epsilon transition from the uh, final states to this state via epsilon. This will uh, eliminate some small uh, tiny bugs. Oh, and uh, of course, how could I forget? The epsilon transition to the to the, the old start state. So here's another quick visual proof that uh, regular languages are closed under the clean start. Simple. All right, let's do an interesting one now. That was kind of boring. Oop, not definition. Excuse me. Uh, regular languages. are closed under union. OK. This one, it's actually uh, very easy if you think about it. I'll put it like this. Here's. What you do is you just want, you can think a union is kind of like an or, right? Right, so recall that uh, L1 union L2 is equal to x is a string such that uh, x, is, x is in L1 or x is in L2. That or is really important. That's sort of like... Uh, you might think sort of towards a non-deterministic choice kind of thing, right? So that's why this becomes sort of uh, easy. So what we're going to do is just add a new start state. And then just hook it up with an epsilon transition to the old start states. easy. You don't have to make it accepting or anything. Now, if a word was going to be accepted by L1 or L2, you just basically run it on each branch. Done. Okay. Now, let me show you a more interesting one with a different kind of proof. In fact, I'm going to prove this one twice uh, using two different ways. Uh, regular 
uh, languages are closed under intersection. Uh, and here's the first proof. Let L1 comma L2 be regular. Then L1 intersect L2 is equal to L1 intersect L2 complement complement, right? The law of double negation. That's straight. Ah. Then we can apply De Morgan's law on sets. This is equal to L1 union, excuse me, L1 complement union L2 complement complement, right? If you uh, have a question mark on your head, uh, just do a quick review of De Morgan's law. Chapter 0 in the Sipster book, I think, uh, covers it. It has a page about it, right? Um, Okay, so we know already, though, that regular languages are closed under union and complement. So what this means is that this is regular, this is regular, then this is regular, and then the complement again is regular. Done. Now... You might be thinking, well, let's make it. Let's make the DFA for it, if that's true, because it's we show the intersection is regular. Obviously, we might be able to make a DFA for it. So what you might think is, okay, you might try and construct the DFA uh, this way, where you take the two DFAs, you complement them, you union them as we did before, and then you complement them again. However, the proof we did of complement is not by flipping an NFA state, but by flipping a DFA state. So you would have to convert this epsilon transition uh, thing for the union into a DFA and then complement it, which is kind of messy and ugly. But we have a better way of doing it, which I'll show you right now. Okay, what I'm going to do is make a DFA to simulate both DFAs at the same time and then accept only if one DFA, if both DFAs accept, right? So what I'm, what that means is, you know, we cannot go back to the, we cannot like run one DFA, then go back to the beginning and then run it again on the input. Once we've seen the input, that's it. There's no undo. It's like in Super Mario World where you can't like scroll back. That's kind of like the model here, okay? But what we can do is keep track of where we would be in both DFAs at the same time using something like a Cartesian product. Uh, and it may, if you're familiar with like a graph product, I think this is something similar as well. So what I'm going to do is let's let's just compute, let's just show a, a a product of DFAs. So let uh, let D one equal sigma Q one capital Q1. Let's make the start state Q1 instead of Q0 or something. Delta 1 and final states F1. Then let's make uh, D2 the same. Sigma Q0, Q2, excuse me, uh, Q2, Delta 2, F2. Now to take the product, what we're going to do is make D to be the same alphabet. Uh, we're going to take a Cartesian product of our states. We're going to have the start state be both previous start states. We're going to have something called delta prime, which I'll define later, and then we'll have our final state uh, be the Cartesian products of our final states. So then I'm going to define delta prime in the following way. Delta prime, if it sees 
uh, Q, I, Q, J, and symbol A is going to move to state as if it was moving with those both transition functions. Uh, right? So what that is is going to be uh, delta 1, Q, I, excuse me, that's Q, J, Q, I, comma, A, comma, uh, delta 2, Q, J, comma, A. So basically what we're doing is we're sort of moving through both DFAs uh, at the same time, right? This is, uh, you know, the formality here makes it sort of obvious, but if you want an example, let's do one, a quick one. So let's do two DFAs of two states just to make my everything nice for me. Okay, and then I'll, I'll just go ahead and draw what our, what, our, what our product DFA should look like. So because Q1 and Q2 are each two here, our product should be four, which should make sense. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to say, this, let this first DFA be uh, strings which end with a, strings which contain a one. How about that? If you contain a one, this DFA will accept you. Okay. And now let's make this DFA, um, if you end with a zero, how about that? End with a zero. If you see a one, you have to go back. And if you're here, if you keep seeing zeros, great. If you're here, you keep seeing ones. Yeah. These are the start states. So just to make everything easier, let's make this state. Let's just call these 0, 1, 2, 3. So then the Cartesian product states are going to be uh, 0, 2, 0, 3. One, two, one, three. Maybe I should have named them something different, but it's fine. So those are our states. Done. Our start state is then the start states of both. And in this case, it's zero, two. So it's going to be this was our start state. Now we have to fill in the transition table. So if we're in state zero and in state two and we see a zero, we're going to go to zero, three. So on zero. If we're straight we're in state zero two and we see a one, we're going to go to one two. Right. Okay. If we're in state zero three, so these two, if we're in state zero three, we're gonna to go to zero three. If we're in state, uh, um, let me think. If we're in state zero three and we see a one, we're going to go to one two. Okay. Now, if we're in state one two and we see a zero, we're going to go to one three. If we're in state 1, 2, and we see a 1, we're going to go to 1, 2. So back to itself. If we're in state 1, 3, and we see a uh, if we see a 0, we're going to go back to ourselves. If we're in state uh, 1, 3, and we see a 1, we're going to go 1 here and 2 here. So we're going to go to 1, 2. If we see a 1. Okay. That pretty much looks right. Let's check it. So uh, 
let's try a string uh, that it, that should be go to the accept. Oh, let's say our accept state. The accept state is going to be accept state of both here, which is just one three. So this is an accept state. Okay. So one zero should reach an accept state, right? One zero. What about one one? One one. Okay, fine. What about zero one? That contains a one, but it does not contain a uh does not end with a zero. Zero one. Okay, uh seems right to me by example. So the I if you wanted to extend this to uh not an intersection, but a union. What you could do is, uh, instead of uh, instead of f one times f two being for the final states, what you could do is like uh, f one times q uh, union uh, f two times oh, excuse me q times F2. So basically, it's like an or here, right? You could do, let me say, for union. All right, so in that case, it, we would also have to circle one, anything with one or three in them. So this one and this one, right? Which makes sense because it kind of, it kind of looks like that. So, okay, so um, I didn't prove all that for nothing. Uh, I actually have another computational model that I want to introduce. Uh, this is called uh, regular expressions. So there's a few ways you can think about regular expressions. The way I like is you can think of a regular expression as uh, the two different a string. I should say a well a well, uh, a well uh, defined string over uh, 0, 1, uh, the clean star, open parenthesis, close parenthesis, and union. And what we do is we sort of make a string to sort of describe a language. So for example, uh, just colloquially, uh, the star means uh, 0 or more. And like the union means uh, uh, either or exactly once, I guess. All right. So, and then parentheses give us the you know order of operations. So, for example, zero as a regular expression describes the set zero. Easy. Zero star describes the set of all concatenations of zero with itself, including itself zero times. So this is going to contain the empty string. This is going to contain zero. This contains zero, zero, and so on, right? That's a lot of, uh, so now it's an infinite set with a simple star. If I were to do the regular expression uh, one zero star, what I do is I now concatenate one with every string in this language. So what I get is, and we can go in order, we get one, one zero, one zero zero, you know, one zero zero zero, and so on, right? So that's basically how the star part works. If I were to do the zero star, if I were to do the union, this is exactly the set you either choose zero or you choose one right so it's either zero or one but if i were to do something like uh you know zero union one and then with parentheses concatenate that with the one i get uh something like uh uh zero i choose zero and then i have to concatenate with one i choose one and then i have to concatenate with one so that gives me the, the set for example. Now if I were to do something even wilder, if I was supposed to do something like 0 union 1 1 star uh, 
then I would do this. What you may notice here is I kind of have a sort of distributed property. I can say this is equal to the regular expression, uh, 0, 1 star uh, union, uh, 1, 1 star, right? And you can expand those out as I've done before. Let me give you now the actual definition of a regular language. So, uh, a regular language is axiomatic to be defined as A uh, for all uh, A in our alphabet. It's defined as uh, epsilon. Let me write that a little better. It's epsilon, and it's defined as the empty set. Then, if uh, uh, if R1, R2, R, I'm going to write it as uh, rejexes, because that's like the shorthand, maybe rejex i, I'm not sure, uh, our regular expression, then the following are regular expressions as well. R1 concatenated with R2, R1 star, and uh, R1 union R2. are all uh, rejexes. So as you can see, I've sort of you can sort of take rejexes and then just sort of build them up this way. If you have one of these and one of these, you can sort of or them or connect them in that kind of way, right? And uh, you might be sullied by the name, but it is true that uh, regular expressions are exactly equivalent to regular languages, but that's something I'll have to prove in the next lecture. In the meantime, let's just give some more examples of regular expressions, right? So when I say, first I want to show that uh, uh, 0 union 1 star is equal to sigma star, right? So if you, it's not obvious, you can sort of take any string you make let's let's just do a string let's say let's say uh one zero one one right this is in this and we can prove it's also in this right so what the way we do it is uh we would expand this with the following arithmetic zero union one star and we choose it to be four times so we choose as we expand for an element of the string, we say 0 union 1, 0 union 1, 0 union 1, uh, 0 union 1. Then at each, we just choose the bit. So we would choose this one, this one, this one, and then this one. And then that would get us uh, 0, I mean 1, 0, 1, 1 concatenated. So we can do this for every string in sigma star. So, so this would imply that uh, sigma star is a subset of uh, 0 union 1, right? But we know that the converse is also true. That the, so this implies that this, is, that this is true, right? This is sort of a useless reject, uh, rejects. So what I will do is, I, I, if I want to, I may write sigma, just to make things simpler, right? When I mean 0 union 1. So here's an example of a rejex. I gave you one of all strings starting with a one, right? And full zero. So this would be in like in binary, this would be powers of two, right? I could do something like all strings of even length. Right, so exactly, uh, if I want a string, I'm forced to choose from this twice exactly twice. So the length is guaranteed to be even. And I could do this to guarantee the length is, you know, uh, the length has seven or something, right? I could do something like, let's do something uh, weird. Let's do zero, one concatenated with zero union one star uh, zero or something. So what does that look like? Each string in this language starts with the one ends in the zero and if I let's just expand it out we get one zero zero union 
one, one star, zero. And then this is equal to strings with the with at least one one and all zero. So this is actually this is uh yeah, so this would be like uh uh this is let's just write is is equal to one zero zero uh union one zeros of those in zero uh one one zero one 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 zero and so on. You may be familiar with the term rejects from Unix and Linux, or I guess most programming languages also have rejects. Uh, this is sort of where it comes from. Uh, you may notice, though, that only a few operations are defined here. Uh, you can compose and build up the other operations. If you notice, uh, negation is not defined as to be a regular expression. You know. If you use a negation in a regular expression, I maybe will know what you're talking about, but it's not technically a regular expression here. And in fact, I'm not sure, but I think that modern regular expressions, like the ones today used in grep and awk and stuff, are not regular. I think those are like, they allow some things which give them much more use, but maybe they, then they, they, they break from their mathematical roots, which is fine. That's, you're, you're more than welcome to do those kinds of things. So. Uh, next lecture, I'm out of time now, which is fine actually, because I covered so much material in such a short time. Next lecture, I would say I'm going to prove that uh, that rejects uh, are regular, if and only if are regular. So every regular expression uh, has a DFA, and every DFA can then also be converted to a regular expression. Uh, if you uh, are bored, and you're like, wow, I'm going to, I didn't, you know, this was a two-hour class. I'm sort of drained. Some things I would study is big O, uh, graph theory, um, proof techniques, so like contradiction, induction. Um... I think that's it. Okay, well, I'll see you guys in class tomorrow.